make sure I don't go over time, so I need the watch. What do you reckon we do a two hour stretch this morning? Just to finish off with. Four hours, yeah, why not? We go to 2.30 and then we'll all go. Uh, <clears throat> this might be my last chance to say thank you to all you guys. I've had a great weekend. You don't realise how good it is, you know, for an oldie to come along and see young kids praising God. <laughs> it's really, it really is great. Weekend ago, I spent um, a Saturday night with young kids in Sydney, and here I am with all you kids, and it really does us a lot of good. Um, you know, I think I didn't I somewhere talk about passing the baton, and uh, you do really get to a stage where you sort of feel that um, it's nice to see a lot of young kids coming up who are going to praise God and push just the news of his kingdom forward, and that's a really exciting thing, so thanks for doing that for me. It's been a great weekend, hasn't it? The weather's been excellent. Always like that, I bet, is it? Yeah. 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 Yep. I live in a rotten state then. You never tell what's happening at home. But the fact is, it's been wonderful here, so it's just been great. I want to talk to you this morning about Job. And I guess by the time we've been through this character, you'll probably see that there's a sort of another sub-theme running through all of the talks I've given you this weekend. I think it's not only people who came face to face with God, but Job did, and just wonderfully. Um, by the time we finish talking about Job, you're going to start to find I've been talking about loners for the whole weekend, I think. Um, Elijah flew in from the desert, stood by himself, stood in front of kings, but it was just Elijah and his God. No matter where he went, when he went, met the woman who he was going to help to fill up the jar of oil, she called the God Elijah's God and she said what would Elijah's God do because it was just a pair of them just Elijah and his God and um, John the Baptist was the same it was just him and bit by bit when you start to look through the whole of the Bible at the most intimate times of people's lives they're alone and they're alone just with their God and it's just sort of them and their God against the world and that's what it's like with Job Job ends up to be exactly that sort of person. Um, Job's a wonderful book. If there's a book in the Old Testament, I reckon that can change your life. It's the book of Job. And you know what I recommend? We can't read it all. I want to read a fair bit of it this morning, actually. I'm not going to go on too long, don't worry. You're probably thinking, blimey, there's 42 chapters. Um, The fact is that I do want to read a fair bit of it and just look at the story of Job. But... I want to also say to you that it is just the most wonderful book that covers the dilemmas that human beings face whenever they look at suffering in any of its form. But whenever you think that you're supposed to be representing Jesus Christ to the people around you. And it's just the most wonderful book. And I'm going to give you a quick suggestion. If you do decide to read it at one sitting, yes, 42 chapters of one hit. Come on, you could do it in, I don't know, 40 minutes? No, a bit longer. Whatever, you could do it. I suggest you take a very easy English reading version of the Bible. I wouldn't go with the NIV. Any of you got the good news versions hanging around at home somewhere? Very easy reading, not great for a Bible study, but good for just a broad reading to get a feeling of what's going on. Just sit down with the Good News Version, just read it, beginning to end. It's the most wonderful book. It's a book that's got so many levels of meaning in it that I wouldn't for one minute suggest that I've got to all of them. But I just think it's the most wonderful book. It starts off with a person, Job, who we don't even know where he fits in. He's certainly not an Israelite. He doesn't fit into the line of Abraham. We don't know where he comes from. We suspect that he comes from the countries east of Israel, over in those countries that the Bible calls Moab or Edom or places like that. He comes from those sort of areas, but he doesn't find himself in the mainstream of the revelation that we get in the Bible. He's outside of the family of Abraham. And isn't that, that's something sort of interesting, isn't it? Because it tells you that even though you and I have the Bible and we see the story coming down through Abraham, down through David, down to Jesus, there was other people who had received the message of salvation somehow outside of that. Anybody else think of another character out of the Old Testament that you can think of 
that was not included in that line of Abraham, someone who was great, wonderful, an image of Jesus Christ? Melchizedek. Who was he? <laughs> he was the king of Jerusalem. Wasn't called Jerusalem in those days. He was the king of Jerusalem back in old uh, Abraham's day. And he ruled over a city which was called the city of peace. And he was a king and a priest to the Most High God. But we don't know how he got his message. We don't know how God spoke to him. Because it didn't come down through the mainstream of the Bible. There's lots of other people we ask that same question about, isn't there? Who were the wise men who came to see Jesus? And why did they think there should be a star to lead them? Why did they say, we have seen his star? It seems that they came from the same area where Job had lived and they came across as well to see Jesus. Jesus is the only path to salvation. But it seems there were other people who knew something else other than what we know in the Old Testament. And Job was one of them. Job lived in a community. I don't know how long ago the book of Job was written. I'll tell you what seems to be the best guess. is It was written probably... Um, well, I won't say written. The story occurred probably... Uh, around about a little bit after Abraham's time, somewhere between Abraham and Moses, while the people of Israel were down in Egypt as slaves. It's probably that time. And the best we can do is to guess because of some of the names we read in the book and look at other places where those names occurred. And it seems to be that probably that's about the time when it was written. And there are patches in the book of Job which seem to be very, very ancient people, just some phrases that seem to be very old Hebrew. And even the Hebrews today can't translate it because they've forgotten what those words mean. So it seems to be very, very old. But it's most likely that the book was, first of all, passed down by mouth. That the story of Job occurred and it was passed on generation after generation. People told the story. I'm guessing this, but that's the way the evidence seems to line up. A bit like the Aboriginals, eh? Didn't the Aboriginals used to pass down their stories of antiquity, just generation to generation, passing the stories down? Until we get to the period later in Israel's history, probably about the time of King Hezekiah. And at that time, the story of Job is written as we get it now. It's a true story, it's about a real guy, but probably it was written about then because there are some literary characteristics in it that seem to indicate that that's about the time it was written. Anybody tell me what it looks like when you read it? Does it look like a novel? Anybody know what it looks like? It looks like a play, exactly. It looks like a play. When you read it, it comes out in acts with speakers speaking their lines. It sort of has a prologue, a bit of a story for a couple of chapters, it has an epilogue at the end, a bit of a story for a chapter, but in the middle there are just speeches and it just goes this repetitive pattern of speeches. Um, you basically get Job starting off and having his speech and then it's followed by one of his friends, then Job has a speech, then one of his friends, then Job has a speech, then one of his friends and that pattern is repeated three times. The fact that it could very well have been written as a play and a morality play has got nothing to do with the fact that it's a true story. It really happened. But it's been probably put down to a poetic form. What part of the Bible does it occur in? The poetry bits. It's in the poetry. Didn't we have the question last night? Which of the poetry books? Yes. The fact is that it's right in there with the Proverbs, the Psalms, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, all of the poetry of the Bible. And it's there because it is poetry. In fact, if you have um, a Bible that writes its poetry with little spaces in between all the lines, you'll probably see the majority of the book of Job is written like that. You know, it's very, very difficult to tell Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry is very different to English poetry, and therefore when you read it, it's very, very difficult to tell its poetry. But the fact is that when you hold your Bible up, if you've got an NIV or something, you're likely to find there are lots of gaps between the lines, and the lines are only half finished and then start again. And that's the best way of telling that you're reading Hebrew poetry. Because probably you or I are not much of an expert on Hebrew poetry. 
Okay, so basically what you've got then is this story which is a poem or a play. And it's written for people to read and see what happens. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happens. And then I want to go through sort of in some more detail. There's this guy called Job. And at some stage he lives on the face of the earth. And he is a great man who loves God and turns his back on evil. And he spent his whole life worshipping God. In fact, he so loves God that he spends all his time worrying about whether his kids do too. And whenever his kids have a party, he runs home and offers a sacrifice and says to God, please look after my kids just in case they said something wrong last night. And he spends all his life praising and worshipping God, but not only looking after his kids, he looks after all the young people around him as well. You soon find when you start to read through the story that he's been giving advice to lots of other people all his life. And one day, I'll give you my interpretation. We'll have a look at the words in a minute. The church comes together. The church get together and in prayer they talk to God. And one of the members of the church talks to God and God says to this member, what have you been doing? He says, oh, I've just been roaming around having a look. And God says, have you noticed Job? What a wonderful example he is. How he's perfect how he turns his back on everything evil, and he loves what's good. And this person says, yeah, I know that, but he only does it because he gets all the good things from you. Of course he's going to worship you, because he's got a wonderful house, he's got great kids, ten children, which in those days was a blessing. <laughs> Wouldn't be a plus today, I would have thought, but there you go. The fact is, he's got ten kids, and they're all doing the right thing and everything's going really well. He's got lots of money. He's got a lovely house he lives in. Everything's wonderful. And so this person says, of course he's going to worship you. But if you took that away from him, if you made him miserable and alone and naked with no children, no money, no house, no nothing, I bet he'd turn his back on you and he'd curse you to you in your face. And so God says, okay, I'll test it. I'm going to let you, I'll give you my power to take away from Job everything that he has. So poor old Job sitting at home and someone comes in and says, oh, guess what? All your camels just dropped dead. And while that person was speaking, someone else came in and said, guess what? A band of raiders came over the hill and stole all your donkeys. And while he was speaking, another person came over the hill and said, guess what? Lightning came from heaven and killed all your sheep. And while he was speaking, somebody else came in and said, guess what? All your kids were in a house and the wind came and blew it down and squashed them all. And Job loses everything in what appears to us to be an instant in time. And he's lost everything. And then he makes, and we'll read this in a minute, the most wonderful statement. The most wonderful statement that stands up as a record for every believer for all time. He simply says, I received good at the hand of God. Why shouldn't I receive evil? I came into this world naked. I'll go out naked. Praise be the name of the Lord. And that's a magnificent response to anybody who has lost anything in their life. The same person who didn't like Job comes back to God again and says, Oh, that's okay. Yeah, Job still worships you, but the fact is that that's because you haven't touched his body. If you actually touch his body, if you make him actually start to get sick, and look disgusting so that people can't even stand to look at him, then he'll turn his back on you and hate you. And so God says to this person, okay, I'll let you do that to him. Make him sick, make him smell, make him ugly, make him disgusting, but don't kill him. That's all. And so poor old Job ends up covered in boils, which was the visual aid for the weekend. Do you remember that? Best I could do. Covered in boils, only like that all over. So bad that he couldn't stand even his clothing to be on him. And he stank and he was just a mess. And he sat himself in an incinerator, covered in ashes. There was probably good reason for that. Anybody know why, if you're covered in boils, you'd sit in an incinerator? I mean, when it was off. And cover yourself with ashes? People tell me it's sterile. People tell me that it's, that it's actually very sterile. 
because it's actually been cooked and any bugs or whatever uh, won't infect the wound and if you cover yourself in ashes you're actually covering yourself in a layer which is absolutely sterile so people tell me and there he sat and then some friends heard about his plight these were also very rich men these were men who lived probably quite some distance away but had known Job because I guess they were sort of you could almost think of them like the elders who knew each other because they would get together and work out wise instructions for young people and they came down and they sat around Job and they mourned with him for a long time for seven days they sat and mourned with Job and after that time Job just couldn't shut up anymore and he starts off by wailing and saying, I curse the day that I was made. I have lost everything. I'm in misery. Even his own wife had turned her back on God. And there he is with nothing left in his life. His children are gone. His wife has deserted the worship of God. And he is sitting there thinking, why has all this happened to me? And he says, I wish that I was never born. And then his friends say, look, Job, we're really going to try to help you. We're going to try to help you and we're going to tell you something. It's the same thing you've been telling the young people for the last 70 years, Job. If you are good, God will look after you. If you are good and follow God, he will bless you. And he will make sure that you flourish and you prosper and everything around you is happy. And if you don't obey God and if you don't do what he asks, then God will correct you, just like a father does to his child. You know what happens if you've got a child? No, you don't. You don't know yet what it's like to have a child. But let me tell you, well, you probably know what it's like when your mum and dad go crook on you. It's always with very good reason, isn't it? Exactly. Parents know everything. And they say to you, don't do that, or they ground you, or whatever they do, they give you rules. And this is what the friends of Job said. Job, God's just giving you some rules. God is doing you a favour. God is saying to you, Job, you've done something wrong. I'm going to correct you and bring you back again and make sure you're back in your mind again. And all the words went around in Job's head and he thought, yep, that's what I've said. That's what I've said to all the young people. And Job used to believe it. And it all sounds so logical. Yes, parents do correct their children. Yes, indeed, correction does come on people who need it. But the thing that stuck in Job's throat was he didn't need it. He hadn't done anything wrong. What? Hadn't done anything wrong? Of course he'd done things wrong. But he had prayed to God for forgiveness. He had not turned away in any degree that would have deserved this. And so Job makes his next speech. And he says, but I haven't done anything wrong. God is blaming me innocently. I haven't done anything wrong. And you see, all of them at this stage were pervaded with this idea that if you are good, God blesses you. And if you are bad, God curses you. And I want to show you somewhere during this morning that they had pretty good reason to interpret some passages of the Bible that way. But this is what I said to you on the first day. You have got to look at your experience. You've got to make sure that the way you understand God fits the experiences that you have. And here poor old Job was in a huge dilemma. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't done anything wrong. And yet he was God stripping him of everything that he had, apparently punishing him. You and I know why, don't we? We know why it's all happening. We know why. There was this bad person in the meeting called Satan who needed some tests to make sure that Job really did love God. We know why it's happening. It had nothing to do with Job. Nothing to do with Job at all. Job was suffering for someone else. Job didn't know it, but he was working towards the conversion of Satan. And we'll talk about that word Satan in a minute. And poor old Job, speech after speech, laments the fact 
but he didn't understand why God was doing it. And his friends, speech after speech after speech, say, and they get worse and worse and worse. They really get angry at Job. And they say, Job, you've got to admit you were wrong. You've got to own up to the sin. I don't know what it is, but you must have done something terrible. Otherwise, God wouldn't have done this to you. And Job says, well, I haven't done anything wrong. And they say, don't lie, Job. It's got to be in there somewhere. And it goes on and on and on and on. Through another one, you get another person turns up. The whole play's only got five characters beside God. Do you know the book of Job contains the longest speech recorded by God in the Bible? There is more of the words of God. I don't, I think that's right. I, I don't include a prophet, you know, like Ezekiel says, thus saith the Lord, and he gives out. But from the word, the mouth of God, there are more speeches in the book of Job from the mouth of God than there are in any other book of the Bible. There are only five characters in the whole book. Job, his three friends, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, and those three friends try to talk him around to believing he must have done something wrong. Then, after a while, up jumps a young man, one of the young people that they've been teaching. And he's been sitting there listening to all this. His name's Elihu. And he jumps up near the end of the book, about chapter 34 somewhere, and he says, I've been listening to you guys going on and on and on. None of you have been able to convict Job of what's wrong. And so Elihu has a go for four or five chapters. Um, he'd be a really hard guy to live with, I reckon, Elihu. It takes him a chapter to explain why he starts talking. <laughs> You've got a whole chapter devoted to why I'm going to talk now. And uh, then he goes on and on and on and on until eventually you get to chapter 37. Chapter 37 is a great chapter. We're going to have a look at it in a minute. Ah, oh, it's just, if ever there's a chapter about a visual aid, chapter 37 is about it. Fantastic. And then at the end of chapter 37, God just cannot stand it any longer. And he answers Job. This huge storm comes. I wish we had one behind us. You had this huge storm. And the clouds are rolling in and there's lightning and the sky turns leaden. And Elihu sees it coming and he says to Job, God's on his way. And then suddenly this huge storm comes over the top. And the Bible says there was a whirlwind and the voice of God speaks out of the whirlwind and speaks to Job. You know, the whole book Job's been saying, I wish I could talk to God. I wish I could talk to God. I'd tell him I'm righteous. I tell him that I don't deserve all this stuff that's happening to me. If only I could speak to God. And then he gets his chance. And he says nothing. Because the power of God comes over him and speaks to him. And there he finds the message that finally satisfies him. I'm going to read you a bit of that message in a minute. And here's Job has lost everything. And there's this huge philosophical conflict going through their mind. Why is it that good people suffer? It's the same question you and I have been asking for thousands of years. It's the same questions the disciples asked Jesus. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that their child was born blind? It's the same question you and I would ask if our baby in our arms dies. It's the same question that everyone asks. Why is it that bad things happen to good people? And you know what God says? He starts telling Job all about ostriches and whether they step on their eggs or not. And you think, what's that got to do? What's that got to do with the question? I'm going to show you, I hope in a minute, it's got everything to do with the question. It's got everything to do with it. And you get to the very end, after God has spoken. And God says at the very end, and this is really worth remembering, he says to the three friends, you have not spoken rightly of me as my servant Job has. Go and ask Job now to make sacrifice for you and I will forgive you. Who? I will forgive you, the guys that were still rich, the guys that still had the full wallet, the guys that drove up in their Porsche. I will forgive you for your stupidity. 
but you'll have to get Job. Who? The man sitting in the ash heap, the man who's been punished, the man who's suffering with the boils. I'll get him to pray for you. And I will accept his prayer. And I will forgive you, you stupid people. Because Job spoke what was right of me. And there's a really important two things to remember about this book. And I hope you remember this if you remember nothing else. I'll probably say that ten times this morning. The book starts by saying, Job was a righteous man. Job didn't say that. God said it. The book starts by saying, Job was a righteous man. And it ends by saying, Job spoke right of me. From the beginning to the end of this book, the book confirms that Job was a righteous man. You know, there are some people who like to say that Job was um, had a few problems himself, that maybe he was even his own Satan. Maybe it was really doubts inside Job that came up. And, you know, that just denies the whole point of what the book's there. It wasn't to teach Job. It was that Job should suffer for the doubts of what emerged to be his friends, for everybody else. It was Job that was suffering. And when you get to the end of the book, it's Job who eventually has to offer prayers on their behalf. Job, who's covered in sickness and boils, and he's a mess sitting in the garbage. No, the incinerator. He is the one that then has to make intercession for God. He suffered and he bore the stripes of sinners. Who is he? He's Jesus for them, isn't he? He's a righteous man who suffered that they might be brought to God. And at the end of the book, it's his prayers that go up. They are covered by Job's righteousness in symbol, in symbol. It is Job who has to pray for the forgiveness of these friends. And God begins then to forgive them. And it's only then that Job gets restored. This is really important too, I reckon. Job's still a mess at the end of the book. And he sits there and he says to God, he says, God, I've heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. God, I'd heard about you, but I've seen you face to face. Did he get better then? Did all the boils fall off? Will his cows come back? Nope. Job was fine. Job was right. What hadn't been fixed was his three friends. It wasn't till they had come and were forgiven that he was finally restored to his position. That all of the blessings came back It was after they had been forgiven. That's when it happened. Okay, I want to read a bit of it. Uh, Actually, first of all, I want to have a look at Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm going to put this thing on. Does that work? Yeah. I've got these red overheads because I think red looks sort of more ghastly. Um, Can I... I need the top and focus for the bottom, isn't it? Ah, it doesn't matter. That's just a good backdrop, that's all. That's how poor old Job felt. There he was in the middle with everybody looking down on him. And he said he'd become a spectacle for everybody. Everybody looked at him and laughed at what they saw. Have you ever thought to yourself, there are so many great people in the Bible There are so many wonderful people in the Old Testament. Jesus is the ultimate symbol for all of us. Jesus was the only person who led a sinless life. But in the Old Testament, there's so many wonderful characters, isn't there? There's Abraham, Moses, David, Samuel, Daniel. Have you ever wondered? I wonder which one God reckons is the best. I wonder which one God would pick. Abraham was his friend. David, he spoke to heart to heart. I wonder which one God would pick. Well, I'm not going to try to answer that question. But I am going to give you one passage that tells us who God would pick to represent the most righteous person. And it's in Ezekiel 14. Verse 14. 
And I'll bet it's not the ones you would have picked. Because the people of Israel are so evil, God says to them, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job, were in it, they could only save themselves by their righteousness, declares the Lord. Even, God says, if the three most righteous people I could think of were amongst you, they wouldn't save you. You're so wicked. They would only save themselves by their righteousness. Now, I've got bad news for you about Daniel. I'm sorry about this. That's not the Daniel in the lion's den. You know when it says Noah, Job and Daniel? It's not the lion's den, Daniel. Sorry. We don't know who it is. We've lost that one in antiquity somewhere. It's spelt quite differently from the Daniel in the lion's den. That's not him. So it brings us down to two, Noah and Job. Would you have picked those as being better than Abraham and Moses and David? And yet they're the symbols God's picked. If you want righteousness, that's the two I'll pick, he says. But there's something in common between them, I'll tell you now. God looked down, it says in Job chapter 1, and he looked through the whole earth. And on the whole earth there was none like Job. He was the most righteous man on earth. Who was the most righteous man on earth in Noah's day? Pretty obviously Noah. It's the only one that lasted, beside his kids. Yeah, they were both the most righteous person on the face of the earth. That's the way the book of Job starts. And I do want to just read you um, a couple of verses. Because they're really, it's, it's really important to see how the book starts. In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. That's the way it starts. He was a righteous man. Do you know how you become righteous? Didn't say sinless. How do you become righteous? Have faith and get forgiven. That's how you become righteous. It doesn't mean you've got to be good all the time. It means you've got to try. But it doesn't mean that you're sinless. It means if you come to God and fall down on the ground and say, forgive me, you're righteous. Because all your sins have been covered by Jesus Christ. And that's the definition of this man. He fell down in faith before his God every night and said, forgive me for anything I have done. And said his way to follow again. This man was the best man on earth. And that's the Job that starts the story. And as you go through the story, it says that Satan came up amongst those people. If you've got an NIV, it says the angels gathered toward gathered before God, doesn't it? On the day the angels came to present themselves. That's rubbish. The NIV is great except for the places where I don't like it. It's not the translation, it's not what the Hebrew word says at all. It says the sons of God came to present themselves. Hey, who are the sons of God? You and I, aren't we? Aren't we the sons and daughters of God? That's what the Apostle John calls me. He says we are now the children of God. We are the sons of God. Everybody who's in a relationship with God are his sons and his daughters. Jesus is my brother. God is my father. How more could I make out that I'm his son and you're his daughter? We are the sons and daughters of God. It is the believers. That's the ones who came. And amongst them came Satan. Ah, oh, what the mess the world's made of Satan. You know why it's a mess? Because the stupid people didn't translate the word. It's just a Hebrew word like everything else. And they left one Hebrew word untranslated. It just means an enemy. That's what it means. It's used heaps before the book of Job. It's used all through Chronicles. But it never gets called Satan. It always gets called an enemy. The Philistines said that David is our enemy. They actually said David is our Satan. But the fact is, the Bible translates it, well, the translators translate it as enemy. But they get to Job and they go, oh, no, we don't translate it. Let's make it look mysterious. Let's make it look like some beastie. It's just the enemy. In amongst the church, they all came to pray to God. In amongst an enemy of Job came. And he said to God that Job he's only nice to you because of all the good things and so all these terrible things happen to Job all these terrible things happen to him and then finally he says in verse 21 naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart 
The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Praise be the name of the Lord. And then after that, he got all the boils and everything and his body fell to bits. And he still praised God. And then after that, I'm going to read chapter 2, verse 11. Because I'm going to say a little bit about his three friends. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz, the Tebanite, and Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the name of the Bible, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathise with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognise him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights and no one said a word because they saw how great his suffering was. For the rest of the story, they try to convict Job of what's wrong with him. And people end up saying, oh, they were really nasty to Job and they're called Job's comforters which really means someone who's pretending to be nice but really is nasty to you. But I want to just concentrate on those words we just read. They came and cried with their friend and sat with him in silence for seven days because they saw how great his mourning was. Anybody here been to visit someone in hospital lately? Ever? How long did you stay? An hour? That's okay. Visiting hour. You know, at the end of the hour, you start to look at the wall. I usually pull those plastic gloves out. You know, they've got, always got the box of gloves. And you pull them out and you blow them up. And you pull your sleeve over and you walk around with this white hand sticking out like this. <laughs> because there's nothing much else to do, is there? You know, and you sort of pretend to shake hands with it. and You can let them go you're around the room. And that's it for the hour. How would you like to go and visit a sick friend and sit on the floor for seven days and seven nights and not speak? I guess you're allowed to go to the loo. That's a pretty good friend. That's a pretty good friend. And I suspect these guys were rich men. They had their own businesses. You don't just pack up your business and come and sit on someone's floor for seven days. You have to arrange to put people in charge. You have to arrange all your affairs. You fix it all up. It's a lot of trouble. And you come and you sit with your friend. And you sit for seven days. That wasn't the end of it. There's a long time after that though with their friend. And then Job starts to say, I curse the day I was born. These men loved him. They did. They loved him. And they thought they were doing the right thing when they started. They thought, we're going to get this over quickly. Poor old Job suffering because something he's done something really bad and we're going to fix it for him. And so they did the best thing they could think of. They started giving him advice. Look, Job, this is the way to fix it. Every husband ought to remember that. <laughs> You'll find later that it's a big problem between husbands and wives. Husbands always try to fix it. They always tell their wife what the problem is and how to fix it. The fact is, it's a male thing. They always love to solve a problem. They don't want to just listen to someone. They don't want to just identify. They want to fix the problem. So there they are standing there saying to Job, this is how to fix it. And it wasn't how to fix it. But after a while they got angry. They got vicious because Job wouldn't accept what they were trying to tell him. They would not accept it. And bit by bit, they get sort of more angry and more angry until you get finally, all the speeches have sort of gone through, and Elihu stands up, this young man. And he stands up and he says to them that you have got it wrong. None of you are able to convict Job of what's wrong, so he has a go. And here's an interesting thing. The, later, the more you go on in life, and you ever listen to anybody else talk about the book of Job, You'll find, I have found, that people can't agree whether a lie is good or bad. You'll find some people reckon a lie is really good and what he's saying is right, and other people reckon he's really bad and what he's saying is just as bad as the three friends. It's weird. And there's all these Bible students getting up there, and there's five or four chapters of the Bible they can't tell whether it's the words of Satan or the words of God. It's really interesting. I reckon he's a baddie. Okay. 
So Elihu stands up there. He basically says the same thing. He says, who is this like Job? Who drinks up scorning like water. Job who won't recognise all the evil that he's done. And then you get to chapter 37. I want to read a little bit of chapter 37. It's a great visual aid. Let's think the visual aids. You get to chapter 37. And I want to just read a few verses. And I want you to try to visualise this. They're sitting on the ground. Just imagine. You're looking across the sky. And it's going, you know, that sort of deep yellow colour the sky goes before a really big storm is coming. And Elihu says the sky looks like it's poured out lead. It's almost shining with the coming of the storm. Verse 1. At this my heart pounds and leaps from its place. Listen. Listen to the roar of his voice, the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He unleashes his lightning between the whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. And that comes the sound of his roar. He thunders with his majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvellous ways. And he goes on to talk about the coming storm behind him. And all the way through, he refers to the power of God, but also the storm that's come. Verse 19. Tell us what we should say to him. We cannot draw back. Sorry, we cannot draw up our case because of our darkness. Should he be told that I want to speak? Would any man ask to be swallowed up? Now no one looks at the sun, bright as it is in the skies, after the wind has swept them clean. Out of the north he comes in gold and splendour. God comes in awesome majesty. The Almighty beyond our reach and exalted in power. In his justice and great righteousness he does not oppress. Therefore men revere him. For does not he regard all who are wise in heart? And there's this image of this storm coming. And then in chapter 38 that we read, suddenly out of this wind, out of this huge storm, the voice of God says, Who is this that speaks words without wisdom? And this is what he answers to Job. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man and I will question you and I'll make sure that you answer me. What's God get against Job? What's God's problem with Job? Job was righteous. Job was suffering for Satan. Wasn't Job's fault. Job hadn't done anything wrong. But God was getting a bit cross. And the reason he was getting cross was that Job was maintaining his righteousness but not standing up for God's. Job was saying, God, I'm righteous. If only I could talk to you, I could convince you of that. God, you're always on my back. You're always picking on me. Give me a break. I love the contrast to the Psalms where David says, isn't it wonderful in all the heavens that God notices us? What is man that thou art mindful of him? And David saying, isn't it great that God notices me? And Job says, just stop noticing me for a while. Just turn your back. Don't look at me. Don't pick on me. And they're both wonderful, righteous men. There's a lesson in prayer here, guys. You're allowed to wrestle with God a bit. And God says to Job, I am in charge of everything. How dare you ever question my righteousness? You may not know what's going on, Job, but I am in control and my righteousness comes first. And that was the only thing that God felt that Job had done wrong. I think we're up to a light here, aren't we? Pass a light here. Here's a light here. An impressive young man. Standing up and telling them all what they already know. The fact is, there's the voice of God now speaking and God answers them out of this whirlwind and God continues to go through and show his greatness. And if you read all of that chapter that we just spoke about, you'll find that it's God saying to Job, never answers Job about his problem, never tells Job what went wrong, just says to him, 
I am always in control. When you can tell me the way lightning is formed, when you can tell me the way the earth is hung in the universe, when you can explain to me the way Pleiades and Orion are spread out of the sky, then you can start teaching me about how to look after my children. And that was the message that Job was getting. If you read that chapter 38, it's really interesting because there's lots of things we already do know now. You know, God's saying, do you know about how the hail is formed? Well, Job didn't, but I do. Do you know the storehouses of the snow and the hail? Ah, uh, yep. Do you know how lightning is formed? Ah, uh, yep. The fact is that many of those things we do know now, but they are replaced with numerous more questions that we don't understand. I like it when he talks about Pleiades and the stars. It's a bit of a thing of mine. If you know the saucepan? You know the thing you call the saucepan out there? It's Orion. In Orion's belt, there's a star-forming region. If you get a good telescope and you have a look at the belt of Orion, you'll see young stars being born. I'll tell you now, that is still a mystery as to how those processes go on. Anybody interested in astronomy or cosmology? Yeah. You know, that I can imagine God was writing this now. He'd say, can you tell me what happened before 10 to the minus 43 of a second after the Big Bang? Can you tell me what happened before the Planck time? That's the problem for the modern cosmologist. We still don't know. Doesn't matter what you pick, we still don't know it. We still don't know. And then he turns to chapter 39, and this is the curious chapter. Here's poor old Job suffering, covered in boils, and God says this to him. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? That's verse 1. Verse 5. Who let the wild donkeys go? Verse 9. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Verse 13. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but they cannot compare with the pinions and feathers of the stork. She lays regs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand unmindful that a foot might crush them and some wild animal might trample on them. I mean, who cares? When you're sitting there in ashes on the ground and you've lost your family. But Job does care, and I'll tell you why. If you read that chapter, every single one of those animals God picks on, there's something wrong with them. He says, Job, if you were a farmer, where do you bring your goats to have their babies, to have their kids? Where do people bring their sheep if it's lambing season? Um, they bring them into the paddock close to the house. They'll make sure there are groves of trees around as wind breaks. Uh, they'll make sure there's plenty of grass. Right? Do you know where the wild goats have theirs? Right up in the hills where there's no grass, there's no wind breaks. They're right out in the open, and God is saying, look at them, Job. There are still wild goats. I've done it exactly the wrong way that you think, and they still work. Look at ostriches. What would you do if God said to you, create an ostrich for me? You probably wouldn't have given it such a long neck. But you would have made it lay eggs and sit on them, wouldn't you? Isn't that the way you look after eggs? Just be careful how you sit on them. But you would have made an egg, you would have made it like a chook. What God is saying is, I made it exactly the way that doesn't fit your pattern. You can't understand the method I used. But look around, Job, are there still ostriches? The world's full of them. Well, it was over there then. We've got emus, because they do the same thing. He's trying to say, I am in control. I'm not doing it your way, Job. You will not understand what I'm doing. But I can tell you now, that what I'm doing works. And then you get to the last chapter. Chapter 42. Verse 5, Job says, my, eye, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Yes, Job despised himself because he hadn't stood up for God's righteousness. But now as never before, his eyes had seen God. 
He had heard the voice of God that spoke to him. And it spoke to him out of the whirlwind. And they had all heard the voice of God. And then God said, verse 7, The Lord said these words to Job, and he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, because you have not spoken of me that which is right as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My, my servant Job will pray for you, and I'll accept his prayer, and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And then it goes on and says, The Lord accepted Job's prayer. And look at verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous and gave him twice as much as he had before. When? After he had prayed for his friends. Who suffered for his friends? Who suffered ultimately for his friends? And it's after he's prayed and made intercession for his friends that he was taken to the right hand of God and restored. That was Jesus Christ. You know, Job is a little symbol in the Old Testament of Jesus Christ. He's a righteous man who through no fault of his own suffered that he might bring Satan to understand God. Who's Satan? What? all of you. Who here was an enemy of God? All of us, before we knew. All of us, before we believed. All of us, before we give ourselves to Christ. And Job suffered for the enemy. And he brought them to God, and through his prayer they were forgiven. And that's the intercession that Jesus Christ makes for us. I don't want to say any more about Job now. I'm exhausted. But you could go forever. It's a wonderful book. Will you promise me you're going to go home and read it? Be careful. Never make a promise that you don't want to keep.